Lab 30 is about taking input from your user. Right away, we have to learn about exceptions because users do not cooperate. Maybe, maybe not, but you have to be prepared. So we have to learn about exceptions, is what, which means what you do when the wrong thing happens or something that you don't expect it happens. First, we'll be taking input from standard in from our user. We'll take a look at getInput.py. And you'll see that there is input, a built-in function. It does a huge job for you. You give it the argument of a string, and that string is going to pop out on standard output. Down here where we run it, we see what is your favorite number. That's from input. And then it waits there. It waits for a user to type something, anything, any amount of stuff. But when it hit, when your user presses the enter key, get input comes back with the string that was given. We have the string 8. Answer equals 8. So we print, you like 8 question mark. Well, I hope you know what's wrong with that. There's a space between the 8 and the question mark. Oh, that's tacky. So instead of that, we're going to remember to plus on to concatenate the question mark. I also put a little space in there, so I was doing a consistent thing, but I don't know if that's useful. And then we get a nicer looking sentence coming out. That number, that answer that was given to us is a string, the data type string, and we want the data type int so that we can run this piece of code that we looked at before and do an evaluation of the number. So we're calling the built-in function int. Some people like to call it a factory function because it'll make an integer out of whatever you give it, if it can. Truthfully, it's a built-in class or a built-in data type. We'll learn all that. Okay, so we're going to make an integer of that 8, and now the number is the number 8, and we can compare it with the 10 and the 1,000 and make this assessment. And we're going to say, but you like. And I want to print the number. Yeah, it's true that I have it as a string in answer, but I wanted to make this point. If you have an integer and you want to print it, or you want to add it to a string, you have to make a string out of it. So we're doing that. Okay, that's a piece of code. It's a little bit faulty, and we'll talk about that in a moment, and maybe you see exactly what's wrong with it. But you're going to, I'll tell you in a moment. But first, I want to tell you that there are these three built-in functions that you find useful. That int, the string, SDR for making a text, and float to get a decimal point in your answer. Well, what's wrong with this? Let's look at a run. Here we're taking another run at this program, but our user does not cooperate by giving us a number and instead gives us X. Well, these two lines turn out the same, except with X instead of A, but then we get an error. When the interpreter does not know what to do, you get a trace back. Well, this tells you most recent call last, so usually it's a good idea to look at the bottom. And when you are making functions that call functions that call functions, you trace back can be large. With the last thing happening, what really confused the interpreter in the end. So the last thing that happened was that the interpreter said, that's not a good value for me. That's literal being another word for string or text. Invalid literal for the int function because it has base 10 X, and that's what my user gave, the string X. So that's no good. Just above it, we see the offending line right there. That's the code. And above it, it tells me in what module 
and what line that is in. So that's very useful. Don't let it frighten you when you see a trace back. Remember, it's your friend. What you want to do so far, let's see if I can do it here, is cut and paste the air and the colon. Cut and paste, cut it, put it on your clipboard because you're going to need it to fix up your code. So it's on the clipboard now. And we're going to be more responsive to our users' problems by changing things. This was our offending line of code. It is now indented under a try colon. Try being a keyword. This means here comes a block of code. And the try block of code ends with the unindentation. Then, always with a try, you have to say accept. Okay, not always, but almost always. You have to say accept, and here's where I pasted in my value error. So if a value error pops out, then we're going to go into this block of code. There is else. Here's another use of the word else. Very good. And uh, this is the last use. You can use it with for loops while loops, if, and try. So if this did not produce an error, then the flow of control goes into the else. And we've seen all that code. Try, accept, else. Get used to it. It's a big deal to you. That you're going to have to do a million times as a Python programmer. I like to show some input patterns just to give you a better feel. Here's one. We're saying on line four, we say while true. So this is a while loop, but true are, and false are the Booleans. For Python, yes, you could use zero in one, but don't make your code English, make it readable. So you don't have to, and nobody who reads your code has to make the translation from zero to false. Don't do that. Use Python. So here we have what is your free favorite number? Calling the built-in input. And we try to make an integer out of it. If there's a value error, then we go around the loop again. If there's not a value error, we break. Now the thing about the else is that it is a very good idea when you do a try to put into that try block of code as little code as you possibly can and only the code that can raise the error, the value error. That's why the else exists, to help you do that. Otherwise, debugging can be much harder. You'll think the problem is something when really it's something else. So you want to separate what can make an error from what cannot make an error like Break is not going to make an error. Break then breaks out. Notice that there's no else associated at the loop level. And that doesn't make any sense. The interpreter will do that for you, but it will never, ever go into the else because true is never false. So this, is, this repeating if never becomes false and never goes into the else. Now I am showing you three different ways to format a string in Python. If you know the percent language from your old code, you might like to use that because it's almost exactly the same. It's a bit simplified in Python. Here I am replacing the integer number into the string. Ah couldn't do that in your old language. You had to use a D. I could use either one. In fact, percent %s never, ever fails in this replacement. It will always do its best to give you the user-readable string that the object is represented by. You'll notice that the syntax is a little different than you're used to. This is my format string. 
Then I put in a percent. Now this percent has nothing to do with module. This is a string operator and you follow it with a tuple of the identifiers that you want replaced. We won't be studying that, but I want you to know that if that's what you know, you can use it. Here's another one. Very handy and some people maybe know it. I don't know. This is the format method of a string. So if a string, if you put in it some curly braces, then you can say dot format and put your identifier there and then that identifier will go into the curly braces. Okay. My favorite and the brand new one well, at this time is to put a little F before your format string. And I do want to point out that on all these, it can be the regular row quote, or it could be the single tick, or it can be either the triple quoting methods. They're all the same. But if I put a little F in front of it, then I am doing an F string. And that means inside my curly braces, I the interpreter will interpret what's in there. Oh, that makes things so much easier and more readable. So it interprets number, and for number, it knows the number, and that's what it puts in the output. All three gave the same thing. The important point here, well, I don't know what you consider more important, but here we have an input pattern where the user does not get out of that while loop until the user gives us a good number to make it in data. You're on for your third set of exercises. Good luck.